Recently we shared a video about prescribed fire, specifically talking about the hand tools we use, kind of how we go about the physical implementation of getting ready to use prescribed fire. Prescribed fire has become a very popular topic among wildlife habitat folks throughout much of the whitetails range. Still slow, almost illegal in New York, a lot of northern states aren't using it, but I'm seeing signs of that coming around. Pennsylvania now is a prescribed fire council, some good stuff going on. But with all this excitement about prescribed fire, let's remember prescribed fire is a tool and it's a tool for a very specific mission. So you need to know a mission, what you're trying to accomplish, rather than just saying, hey, we're going to do a burn. As an easy example, you've got a closed canopy hardwood or pine forest with, you know, inches of inches of leaf duff covering the ground. You burn that off, you reduce some fuel, reduce a little tick habitat, but because it's a closed canopy forest, almost no groceries or cover are going to grow because all the sun's energy is being captured in the canopy of that closed canopy forest. So this is what I'm talking about, knowing your mission. It's not just, you know, a tool. It's a specific tool, and the tool changes depending on your mission. So let's talk about that a little bit. If you have a really heavy fuel load, like here, we've just cut a bunch of cedars, let them dry for a year, and get ready to burn. There's scattered hardwood trees in there. We want to do a very early dormant season right now, wintertime burn, so there's less heat, and we're going to remove that fuel away from the trees we absolutely want to save and reduce that fuel. It's truly a fuel reduction burn. A lot of groceries and cover are going to grow, but if we did that in the summertime, if it would carry, the fire would carry, we would kill every hardwood tree out there we wanted to leave. There'd be so much heat, the heat would penetrate the bark of those trees, and it's called cooking the cambium. We would cook those cells of the tree's circulatory system, and it would certainly top kill it and may root sprout back. So that's one example. If you have a heavy fuel load, but there's some trees in the area you want to save, you want to do a dormant season before the sap is up in those trees, colder temperature burn, and that's one way you can help ensure saving those trees in addition to removing the fuel from several feet around the base of that tree. If I have an area, maybe an old pasture or something, it's got grass like fescue, which could be kind of browning up in the late summer. That's a cool season grass and a bunch of hardwood saplings. I don't really want to do a dormant season burn. I'm going to remove the grass and kill very few saplings. I want to do a growing season burn. Think late July, August, maybe even into September, when those saplings, those hardwood saplings, have the sap up in the tree, the leaves are fully formed, that cambium, the xylem and phloem is working every day, and I can get enough heat to girdle that tree. Most of the tree's energy, the carbohydrates, are up in the leaves, and they transport that down in the root system right before the leaves fall and get prepared to survive the winter. Those trees we call them dormant, it's like a bear though, they're still alive, they have energy to respirate throughout the winter. So a growing season burn is ideal for setting back young hardwood saplings in areas where you don't have larger trees you want to save, or you have to make a big fire break around there. Fires can be custom designed to produce more groceries. Again, a growing season burn has been shown in most areas to result in more forbs growing. Forbs are broadleaf plants, ragweed, something commonly talked about, but there are literally hundreds of broadleaf species that are beneficial for deer and turkey. Dormant season burns tend to favor more grass species. Grass is often considered a bit better cover. And on a dormant season burn, you get some forbs responding. A growing season burn, you get some grasses responding. But if you're hedging, your bet, you're trying to specifically, I want to make this a feeding area for deer. Then I'm going to do that late growing season burn. Matter of fact, this year we had a small area, just a few acres. We did, it's full of grasses and saplings, whatnot. We did a late growing season burn. It come up about yay tall for hunting season and we saw and harvested several deer out of that area. It was literally a native vegetation food plot. So it's real important to know your mission and to design the burn based on your mission. And that may be you've got a 10 acre area prepared you want to burn and you're going to burn half of it during the dormant season and the other half in the growing season based on the needs and maybe the vegetative types in each of those sections. 
I want to share that if you're making cover blocks, I personally like cover blocks that are minimum of 10 acres. Long skinny cover blocks or small a few acre cover blocks are really easy for a coyote, a raccoon, whatever predator, mammalian predator, to go on the downwind side, downhill side at night, thermals are coming down, and smell every nest, every fawn, every nesting hen in there. When we're making cover blocks, we wanna make them large enough to provide real security, not just what looks like cover to us, but for critters to really be in there and make it difficult for a predator to find. Another way we can refine that tool is the intensity of a fire, a backing fire coming downhill or backing into the wind is going to be less intense than a head fire rushing uphill. That heat is rising, it's preheating fuel, drying it out. It's gonna do more consumptions. The flame height is gonna be much taller. You can control the intensity of the fire based on how you set the fire. Again, a backing fire, a strip fire, a head fire. We'll go over those later on, those exact things, and reach the objectives you want to reach. We're going to be doing several fires here at the Proven Grounds coming up. Hopefully, we can share some examples of the day we do those fires of what's going on, you know, live on social media, whatever. But it's real important, again, to know what you're trying to accomplish, not just, ooh, I'm jumping on the prescribed fire bandwagon. You may not do much good for your habitat if you just drop a match and let a prescribed fire hatch. You wanna have a mission and then design your plan to meet that mission. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Soil Pro Outdoors, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Burris Optics, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. Once your goals are defined, you can refine the prescribed fire tool even more by picking the day you ignite the fire. Higher humidity, more moisture and air is gonna seep into those fine fuels, grasses and leaves. They're not gonna burn as aggressively. You can actually slow the pace of the fire and the intensity of the fire down by burning on a higher humidity day. Obviously too high humidity, probably somewhere over 50, 60%. Depending on a lot of variables, site specific to where you are, wind speed, all these things, it may not even carry. Certainly not gonna carry at 100% humidity. So you can pick the conditions you want to help again, get the intensity, the speed of the fire to meet your objectives. If you've just got a bunch of leaf litter on a north facing slope, you're gonna need a pretty low humidity day for it to crack through there, to crawl through there, because on those north slopes that stay shaded most of the time, it's hard to get them to burn. It's just really difficult. If you're south slope, south facing, and you've got dry grass, waist tall, be careful. You burn that on a really low humidity day, you might get to know your neighbor in a big hurry, because that fire may jump and go somewhere you don't want it to go. So on a, a big tall grass, a bunch of fine fuels, I typically want a little bit higher humidity, which makes it so much easier to know exactly how the fire is going to behave. And should it jump a line, easier to control. There's a lot of sources to get weather, but the National Weather Service actually provides fire weather. And they make a graph, you can just page over a little bit, get that graph, click up the top, and there'll be a button that says fire weather. That's gonna give you more detailed information. One thing we wanna think about when we're doing a fire is where's my smoke going? We've all so far talked about what's happening on the ground, our goals and objective. But another real important goal is to know where your smoke goes. If you're in West Texas somewhere and you don't have a neighbor for 80 miles, you're not as concerned. That's rare in most of the whitetail world. We don't want that smoke going over a highway and setting down or a big residential development setting down. So smoke management, as it's called, is just as important as fire management. And I'll mention that the most fatalities from fire come from the smoke, settling on the highway, causing an accident or something like that, not the fire getting out and you know burning down someone over there. So smoke management is critical. And again, we control that by only burning certain units with the wind blowing a certain direction and looking at that fire weather and looking at the ceiling height smoke management and studying the weather and those factors that impact how and where the smoke is distributed is very important.
kind of wrapping this up, it's really important to know your objectives, also know the conditions that day. So you have a plan. I want to burn this unit. I want the wind blowing north away from my neighbors to the south. And then you have to pick the day. Well, I don't want a low humidity day for that smoke setting or whatever it is. I don't want to burn too aggressively. I need a bit higher humidity. Boy, I need a low humidity day because that fire is barely going to carry. There's not much fuel there. Defining this and then picking the day is the absolute key to successfully having a safe and impactful fire that benefits the habitat where you're managing. In the next video in this series, I'm going to dive into more specifics. I'll really talk about head fires, backing fires, strip head fires, and how we use each of those tools very specifically to meet wildlife habitat improvement objectives. Fire has to be the most natural tool in a wildlife manager's tool bag. And speaking of natural, we know it was a part of creation. We read the early settlers reports about prairie fires and woodland fires all over, lightning strike, Native American set. But even more important in studying fire or even improving the habitat where you hunt is improving our lives. And the only way to truly make an improvement in our life is by seeking the Creator's will and applying it to our lives daily. You know, habitat improvements come and go. Life here is short, eternity's forever. The most important thing you can study is the Creator and His will for your life. Thanks for watching, Growing Deer.